Okay. Hi, everyone. I think we can get started for today. Uh, so welcome to this installment of the SIMM webinar series. Uh, I'm Quinn Reynolds from Mintec. I'll be chairing the session today. We'll be having, having an oral Q&A. Uh, so please hold your questions until after the presentation and then use the raise hand feature on Zoom and the SIMM team will open your mic up so that you can talk to the presenter. Alternatively, if you do just want to use the text Q&A section, that's fine too. Okay, so today we've got an interesting talk by Dr. Johann Zitzmann on a topic very close to my heart. Uh, Johann's a familiar face in the industry. I think most people who've worked in pyrometallurgy have either heard of him or met him at some stage. He did a PhD on ilmenite smelting at the University of Pretoria, and since then he's gone on to start his own consulting business, Ex Mente, which uses mathematical and computational modeling techniques to advance the state of the art in extractive metallurgy applications. Uh, Johan still has a very strong connection to academia as well. He served as the Extrata Chair in Modeling of Pyrometallurgical Processes for several years at UP, and he still holds an extraordinary professorship there. So Johan always has interesting perspectives on our industry and how to address, address the challenges that it faces, and today's topic I'm sure will be no exception. So thanks very much for your time, Johan, and please go ahead as soon as you're ready. Okay. First question is, can you hear me and can you see me? Okay, you can hear me, but video has been deactivated. Okay. Um, at there least- we we can, That looks fine, Johan, we can see you now. Okay, so at least for the first few seconds, it's always good to see somebody's face in one of these online situations. So uh, hi to everybody. I see we've already got 70 participants and still going strong. And I quickly browsed through uh, who's attending and uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm quite humbled by uh, everybody who's attending and uh, thank you for joining. Um, I think a big part of the intention of today is uh, to initiate discussion on this topic. And uh, I'd really like to get your feedback on, 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 on the thoughts. Okay, so I'm going to start sharing my screen um, so that you can see the slideshow. Um, can everybody see the screen? Yeah, it looks fine, Johan. Okay. So let's get going. So when, uh, thanks for the kind introduction, Quinn. Um, when I'm talking to somebody or somebody's talking to me, I always start with a few introductions. So Quinn has told uh, you a bit about me. So I am a metallurgical engineer by training from UP. And I've been working in pyrometallurgy really and modeling since 1991, which was the, the third year of my undergrad studies. When I did a, a quirkling year at East Port for Nobel Park at the Electric Arc Furnaces. I started experimenting in 2001. I've been guiding postgrads, like Quinn said, since 2013. And the things that excite me are science, technology, developing young people and growing South Africa. Uh, I know we have some international guests as well, so there will be a bit of an international flavor also. And I think many of these topics or the points that I'll be making are definitely uh, valid from a global perspective as well. Okay, so Exmente, uh, just a bit about the company. This is currently our team. We're getting a, another new team member. Dr. Johan Nines is joining us on the 1st of, of August. Uh, he's going to head up the multi-physics modeling group. Um, so what do we do? What does Xmente do? In very plain language, we help our clients to better understand their materials, processes and equipment. And thereby we, we hope to help make them more successful. Okay, our focus is mostly on pyrometallurgy. It's not exclusively pyrometallurgy, but it's pretty much uh, what we do most of the time. And we uh, do process improvement, technology development, new technology development, and that's why I'm talking about it today as well. We do design reviews, operational reviews, 
some advanced process control and, and we also do training to, uh, to people in industry. Uh, the tools that we use are things like computational thermochemistry, process modeling and simulation, obviously, and multi-physics as well, and techno-economic modeling. So we, we do have quite a, a strong modeling focus uh, in the company. Um, our methods, uh, one of the things that we uh, uh, continually say is that method matters. Now, it, method matters if you're not working alone. If you're only one person, it doesn't matter so much, but if you're, if you're a team and you're trying to grow a strong team, it starts to matter. And I share this with you because it, it connects strongly to what follows in the presentation. So we try to strike a, a, a nice balance between being formal and being agile. Uh, we uh, rigorously apply the, the scientific method, uh, frameworks like systems engineering, not completely and formally, but the principles in there, we apply it strongly. Uh, we have structured research methodologies. Uh, we, we use formalized uh, modeling and simulation methods that we have developed in-house. And we do lots of technical writing because writing helps us think and it also helps us remember things as a team. Okay, so what I'll be going through in the presentation are, uh, first of all, just telling you why I picked the topic that I did. Then I'm going to talk about parametallurgical process technology. Now, what is that and what are the characteristics of parametallurgical process technology? Um, computational modeling, a bit about that. And then how does modeling fit in and what can modeling contribute to, to the uh, development of, of new pr uh, process technologies? And then I'll conclude. So let's get started. Um, so this, just to reiterate, this is the topic. So it's about new technology, environmentology, and then how does computational modeling fit in? So the first reason why I picked this topic was is it's very much part of Exmente's journey. Uh, in recent projects, and I see some of the attendees uh, today have also participated uh, in some of the, the projects that, uh, that we've been involved with. So some of these recent projects have had substantial problems, which in my view, in, in, in several cases could have been avoided. Uh, some, of, uh, some of which could have been avoided also with, with uh, the application of modeling. Uh, not, not all of them, but, but at least some of them. Uh, so I do believe that there's a great potential to improve these large scale, uh, as some people call them, mega scale projects uh, that we tend to do in parametallurgy, these enormous smelters that, that we build. Um, in these projects, I've also in many cases seen computational modeling, but in, in, in quite a few instances of, of very poor quality. Generally, when I look at these projects from our perspective and from our appreciation for modeling and, and the value that it can add, I believe that uh, computational modeling is really being underutilized um, in developing these new technologies or, or designing new plants. Um, of course, it is very strongly, uh, picking this topic is strongly related to the fact that we have serious expertise in pyrometallurgy and in modeling and simulation. And ultimately, um, this is core to what we do in Exmente and it is, this is where we can contribute to, to our industry and to our community in South Africa and, and globally as well. Um, if we cast our eyes back a little bit in, in uh, looking at some of the projects, we've had some good projects, uh, smelters that, that's been uh, built. These are some of them, definitely not the only ones. Um, Exmente was involved in the Chinli Ilmenite smelter, which I think it wasn't without its challenges, but it's probably the most successful Ilmenite smelter startup ever. Um, 
the one with the least amount of paint, especially on this melting furnace side. Um, there were, there's been other uh, projects that have been uh, that have uh, faced serious challenges. I think Konyambo Fur and Nickel. Uh, I don't have first-hand experience or knowledge of that, but that had an extended startup time. Uh, the cast chrome smelter in Kazakhstan. I've had the privilege of at least uh, dealing with a lot of information on that project. And uh, the Amic smelter in uh, Ilmenite smelter in Saudi Arabia uh, is also something that we're currently working on. And uh, I think the, these projects, probably all of them, went off script pretty seriously to lesser or greater degrees. And all of them, I think, uh, present us with, with very important and valuable lessons that we can learn going forward. Um, now, if we just think about technology development, um, why would anybody develop new technology? Very generally speaking, I, think, uh, I believe it's, it's driven by, uh, by three things. Uh, to innovate uh, or to develop new technology, it's driven by needs. If you need something, you might make a plan and innovate and develop something. Or if you have a problem, I think COVID-19 is probably a really good example of that. Uh, people are really scurrying to do things new or different uh, or to develop an, an antidote. Um, or if there's an opportunity for, from a business perspective, if there's, there are uh, significant opportunities, uh, people tend to innovate and, and uh, come up with, with new technologies. Um, in the South African context specifically, if we look at our circumstances at the moment, then what we see is um, we have a fairly serious uh, economic decline. Also, and this is one of the causes really of the economic decline is we, we've got an infrastructure decline as well, where over the past 14 years at least, uh, our electricity capacity hasn't really increased. So uh, with a mineral-based economy, uh, if you, your electricity doesn't uh, increase your capacity, then you won't grow that sector of the economy. But we still have substantial mineral wealth. We're one of the most mineral-rich countries in the world. Um, and we've in, we're increasingly exporting these minerals in raw format. Uh, so we're getting less value for, for more material going across the borders. So if we look, look at South Africa, there are definitely needs and problems and opportunities. Um, given that we are uh, dependent on minerals and metals, new pyrometallurgical technologies can definitely contribute to our uh, situation in South Africa. If we look globally, there are perhaps other driving forces uh, which are a, a little bit different from South Africa on its own. There's like always an increasing dem demand for metals, but we have other effects like a mounting waste problem with an increasing need for recycling um, and the uh, waste materials or recycled materials will become uh, fairly dominant uh, raw materials in the future. We also have climate change and the desire to go to renewable energies and, and hydrogen. So in the, in the global context, there are definitely also needs, opportunities and problems. And uh, in that context, new pyrometallurgical technologies can also contribute and they are even being developed as we speak in Sweden, uh, as, as specifically the hydrogen based steel making grid. Okay, so these are the reasons why I picked this topic to, to discuss today and what I wish to achieve with it at the end is um, to create perhaps a bit more awareness 
are the opportunities uh, related to computational modeling also to stimulate discussion because obviously we have a very uh, modeling focused perspective uh, that's the way that i will be presenting today industry might see things differently academia and research we all have our own perspectives um, i think we we really need to get more people involved in, in computational modeling in south africa uh, i i believe that we should increase the utilization of of computational uh, computational modeling in our industry and thereby stimulate and accelerate new technology development so that we can locally help the, the, the economy and globally uh, help uh, the planet as a whole. Um, and these things, I mean, not one person, not one company uh, can achieve these things really because uh, computational modeling needs to be integrated into how we do things currently. Um, so the whole ecosystem must be influenced and the community must uh, collaborate to achieve this. So if we look at, at pyrometallurgical process technology, uh, next, um, the, f the first question might be, is, is there a frequent need for new technology? I mean, the metallurgical industry is, is very old and uh, why would we, we, or how often would we need to have new technologies? Now this, I think, depends very strongly on the commodity that we look at. Um, some commodities uh, have large volumes and, and fairly consistent raw materials uh, and therefore result in stable technology. I think iron making and steel making and aluminium are good examples where blast furnaces BOFs and the whole Herald uh, route are, are, are very uh, stable technologies and, and they, they be, they're being improved incrementally. But other smaller volume uh, uh, commodities like ferroalloys, luminite smelting, or when we look at recycling, for example, uh, will most likely have in some cases, even unique one-off technologies that, that are uh, being developed uh, for a specific resource uh, of material. Uh, uh, Konyamba nickel, I think, is at this stage still unique. Um, and even uh, Middleburg ferrochrome in, and, and uh, Mughali are, are, are unique technologies that are not applied elsewhere in the world with only a handful of those types of furnaces in existence. Um, so just due to the nature of the materials that we process, we might find that it is necessary to, to develop a new technology. Um, what is also one of the attributes of, of, of pyrometallurgical technologies is it's not something that you develop in a few weeks time or a few months. It's rather in one or two decades. It looks like that's the, the, the time scales that these things uh, develop over. The Corex process started in the 1970s and the first uh, unit was installed here in Pretoria um, in uh, 1988. Um, more close to home, Mintec uh, developed, started the development of uh, DC furnaces for smelting, specifically for, uh, for chromite smelting. And that pilot work, the first pilot work started in 1982. And um, in a number, over a number of decades, that technology was scaled up to what is now the largest units in existence are the four furnaces um, in October in, in, in Kazakhstan. And they came online um, in 2014. So you can see that the time scales for these things are, are fairly long. Uh, the Swedish hydrogen uh, route for steel making started in 2016. Uh, it looks like they're progressing fairly quickly and uh, I think the first material will be produced perhaps by 2026, which is already 
again a decade. Now, what we also see is that uh, developing new technology is one thing, but applying it invariably is associated with risk. Um, there's been quite a bit of, of uh, research on this in the past. Uh, this author, uh, Twigger Mollesey, um, in 20, uh, 2003, he evaluated uh, 43 projects. Uh, and of, the, of those 43, a substantial number of them were failures, according to a set uh, number of criteria. And of all the projects that failed in that study, 50% of those involved new technology. So there was a, a strong correlation between using new technology and project failure. Uh, a similar study was done in 2011, where 23 projects were evaluated. And of those 23, 70% either struggled or failed. So again, a very strong correlation between new technology and, and difficulties, long startups, or even shutdown of the facility, um, and, uh, which resulted in complete failure. Um, the book by uh, Professor Rob Boom and his colleagues um, also attribute the same types of risks associated with new technology to custom designed equipment. Now, in pyrometallurgy, we all, we, it's almost uh, standard to do customized equipment. Uh, from one side to the next, it is, it's, it's fairly rare to see complete copies of, of equipment being reinstalled, except uh, perhaps in the steel industry and some of the larger volume industries. Uh, this is the, the book that I was referring to. If you, uh, I can, I can recommend it. Uh, it's, it's, it contains quite a, a lot of uh, really nice information. Okay, so I've spoken quite a bit now about new uh, process technology, but what, uh, what is perhaps needed is to just say uh, or to define what it is. And it's not always so obvious whether a technology, when you build a new plant, whether you are using old or new technology. And in, in some of the recent projects, um, I think uh, there's been this deception of, for example, um, the, the Ilmenite smelter in, in, in uh, Saudi Arabia that used what appeared like proven technology but it was applied in a different way and ultimately we sit effectively with a, with a new technology that we have to nurse uh, to, uh, to full capacity. Um, so a process technology in my view is a, is a complex combination of materials, process and equipment, uh, which is indicated in this diagram. Um, so the, the collective noun of pyrometallurgical process technology is influenced by the raw materials that you process, by the products that you make, uh, the process conditions uh, in that vessel, um, the refractory materials you use and the different components of uh, the, uh, the, the equipment that you employ and even the scale of operation might uh, pose some uh, unforeseen techno technological risks uh, when going into operation. So um, changing any of these underlying factors can leave you um, effectively with a new process technology with the associated risks and drawbacks of that, if, uh, and which is um, bad for a business if you only realize that once you're going into operation. Um, so one has to be uh, particularly sensitive to this during the design stage. Um, now regarding risk and failure and the development of new uh, process technologies, I think based on what I've uh, presented now, 
the literature work specifically, um, the risk is high when developing these things. And it's difficult and maybe even sometimes impossible to avoid, to completely avoid failure and making mistakes. Um, and, and failure and mistakes, I think we, we generally have a negative perception of those things. And uh, it, it might even be associated with our education systems where we are penalized for every, uh, for every mistake that we make. Uh, but failures and mistakes, if we use them carefully and, and wisely, uh, they can be key to learning and to, be, to achieving success. So, but we have to try to fail quickly or fast and cheaply. So if, knowing that you will fail, you just need to fail at the right point in the project. Um, and if we, uh, if we do this, we can learn fast and cheaply. And I think this is the transition point where I'm now going to go from talking about the, the process technology to talking about um, computational modeling. Because in my view, computational modeling provides us the opportunity to make lots of cheap and quick mistakes. And that's one of the reasons it's so, it's so valuable. And it will afford us the opportunity to fail without paying the ultimate price for real failure when going into operation. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about computational modeling. Uh, so when, when I'm talking about computational modeling, I'm actually, I actually mean computational modeling and simulation. Um, but uh, the shorthand is, is computational modeling. And modeling, just to be clear, is the process of creating a computational model. And the simulation part is the process of using that model that you now created to simulate the process as part of research or improvement or to design a new furnace, etc. Um, so if we look at, at these days, the computational models that we create, what do they consist of? Uh, in, in, in the past, we've been talking about uh, mathematical models, we've been talking about numerical models. These days, I think it's more uh, common to talk about uh, computational models. So at the core of all of these process models that we, that we create, we, we generally have one or two, in some cases, a large number of sub-models that describe things like material properties, kinetics, um, the things that, that really make uh, the, the process unique. Uh, specifically for ilmenite smelting, those material properties uh, uh, cause a freeze lining to behave the way that it does or to, uh, uh, will cause a, a slag to foam the way that it does in an ilmenite smelting furnace. Um, so we need to have good sub-models and good data to describe material properties and kinetics and those types of things. And those sub-models become embedded in a formulation, a mathematical formulation of a model, which is a bunch of equations and text. Now the text are things like, uh, what is the purpose of the model? Uh, what assumptions are you making? What, what uh, simplifications are you making? Um, so before you even start to think uh, of, of running a piece of software, you have to be able to describe these things mathematically and you, ha you have to start making reasonable compromises because you generally you, you, we never can afford to model everything explicitly. Uh, so by understanding the purpose of a model well, we can decide sensibly where do we make the assumptions that would not adversely affect uh, the end result. So once we've got the mathematics sorted out, uh, unfortunately, computers are not clever enough to understand mathematics. So now we have to, to, to translate the mathematical model to a numerical model that can do 
fairly simple calculations like matrix uh, solvers. Uh, and to do that, we have to write further equations and we have to, to select uh, appropriate uh, numerical schemes. And ultimately, all of these things can be cast in the form of software, which now becomes our computational model that can be run on a computer. We can compile it, run it, and do our simulation experiments. Um, now, if we look at the nature of modeling, uh, it's the process of modeling is really not just about building models. And I think I've been doing this for a while, so please forgive me for being a bit philosophical about some of these things, but it's, uh, it's, it's quite a, a rich, structured process of analyzing and learning when you build a model. Uh, and th this is one of the, the, the reasons why I, uh, I'm so keen on doing it, and I really love the process of building models. Um, it seriously confronts you with what you don't know and what you don't understand. When you start analyzing a process <coughs> in preparation for, for developing a model, you very soon realize the things that you don't, that you don't know or don't understand, which is already a great benefit. So it helps us to also to identify what is important and what is not important if you have a structured modeling process uh, so that you can make compromises and assumptions on, 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 on certain fronts um, to, to save cost and time but still have uh, results that are applicable and, and valuable to the project that you're doing whether it be development work or design work for a new plant. So modeling, in my view, is an is a extremely effective way to develop understanding and insight about uh, materials and processes and, and equipment in environmentality. Okay, so that's the nature of the modeling process. Uh, now, also the nature of models. Now, uh, George Box in 1978 uh, he said this, and I think some of my colleagues in, uh, in industry would vehemently agree with this statement because they are not very pro-modeling work. Uh, but he said, all models are wrong, but some are useful. And this is really true. Um, modeling are really thinking aids. They are crutches that we use to enable us to, to think more deeply about process problems. Uh, we link all the physics together into a mathematical or a computational whole, and we can manipulate and play around with this, with this um, simulator that we've built uh, without having to make all the connections of heat transfer, fluid flow, property variations, composition, all of those things in our minds. <clears throat> so it enables us to, to deal with that level of complexity that we find in high temperature processes. The one thing that, that often happens is, and I, I often tell my students this, that the model that you develop will never, or oftentimes, especially in, in, in the case of multi-physics models, it will not give you the answer. It will give you information that you can reason about and interpret so that you can get to an answer. But you as an engineer still have the responsibility to interpret and come up with the final decision that's made for a design, for example. Uh, now, these things are often misunderstood. And when you present results to clients or colleagues, uh, you would get a response like, your model is wrong. Now, if we just cast our minds back to George Box, yeah, we know the model is wrong because it's a model. Um, but just because the, the values that it outputs are not perfect does not mean the model is useless because the model can still give us at least qualitative understanding of, of how a system will behave under certain conditions. And even an incorrect model, 
if we discover with high confidence our model is incorrect, there's usually a very good reason for it being incorrect. And it's often that incorrect model uh, shines the light on incorrect understanding on our part, which in its own way is, is very valuable because uh, we might have certain uh, uh, beliefs or uh, implicit assumptions about the process that we're working with. And by modeling it, it shows it up that we that we actually our interpretation is wrong. Now, if we look at what types of models do we do we at specifically in Xmenta use uh, in, in the work that we do, uh, we have lots of uh, material property models. Now, it can be as simple as an Arrhenius plot, like the, what we see in here, or thermochemical. Uh, properties like heat capacity and enthalpy of fusion or thermal conductivity and viscosity and those types of things so that we can see if we uh, uh, change conditions in the process material properties will change and how will that affect the, uh, uh, the process behavior now material property models uh, generally become submodels in other other types of models. We also use uh, uh, very often thermochemical calculations. Uh, now this is a three component, it's actually a four component system with uh, calcium oxide as a fourth component uh, for a typical uh, ferrochrome uh, uh, slag. Now those uh, black dots uh, that, we, that you see there are the unfluxed South African ore compositions um, that is showed and it, it's, it shows us in which phase field we are and it immediately can give you an indication, for example, of what refractory materials you can select for this application. So thermochemistry, because we are operating at such high temperatures and the second law of thermodynamics it, 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 the drive towards equilibrium is extremely strong. Thermochemistry is uh, one of the, the most precious tools that we use uh, in, when analyzing materials and processes and, and equipment. Then we have process models. This is a flow sheet of a mass and energy balance model for, for a, a ferrochrome smelting process uh, from one of the, the articles that we've published. Uh, this was implemented in our MSIM uh, modeling software. Uh, then we also, uh, the, the, the process models, uh, just to go back quickly, describe one process unit, like a furnace or a kiln, while um, flow sheet models can, uh, can describe not just, for example, the kiln that is cent uh, central to this flow sheet, but all the peripheral equipment, um, the, the, a traveling grate, for example, uh, and all the peripheral equipment that um, are involved around that uh, primary piece of equipment. And what we have, what we are seeing increasingly is how important it is in pyrometallurgy to look at flow sheets, not just at the, the core equipment uh, uh, process models, because some of the, the problems that we experience in our primary equipment should, should actually never reach the primary equipment and they can be um, solved through blending in the flow sheet, for example. You can limit uh, variability going into a furnace uh, and thereby um, stabilizing a furnace. And if you have a, a, a good flow sheet model, uh, this, this model is implemented in SysCAD. Uh, then you can uh, study those things and, and make really good, uh, almost cheap decisions on how to avoid problems when designing a plant. Uh, Multi-physics modeling, uh, those are the ones that, that the mechanical engineers develop for us and uh, they are the ones that draw the, the nicest pictures. Now this is an example of a project that we did uh, with our colleagues uh, from KPM in Canada. Um, it was for the, the direct reduction of chromite or for the ring of fire deposit in, 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 uh, in Canada. Um, and we were able to build a very comprehensive um, 
almost virtual pilot plant because uh, the, we, we did not, the, the funding was not available to do pilot plant test work. Uh, but we combined the, the laboratory scale test work that KPM did uh, in their laboratories with our computational modeling work and we were able to incorporate reduction reactions with their kinetics, CO evolution, um, combustion, radiation, the rotation and the granular flow of, of the, uh, the pellets in, in the bed. Um, all of the, uh, with heat transfer, all of those phenomena inside one single uh, computational model. Um, and uh, we used this model to, to generate um, data, which we then fed back into uh, the, the process, process flow sheet model, which was ultimately used as a basis for doing um, techno-economic analysis. Uh, now that project is, a, is an excellent example of, of how computational modeling um, uh, can be used in combination with, with experimental work um, to develop process and evaluate process technologies. So to do computational modeling, you, you need a few things um, and it is quite demanding. Uh, now the I think today the, the, the most core uh, item that we need is, is, a, is a team with the right knowledge, skills and, and experience. Now, I say team because, uh, as I'll discuss in the next slide as well, uh, one person in, it's, it's unlikely that one person is able to do all of the things required well enough uh, to do this reliably. Um, and we also obviously need uh, tools, which are software and hardware and uh, open source software, which we use a lot of, uh, is, uh, is a great enabler and as is uh, the available hardware these days, it's easy to get your hands on, on good quality hardware uh, in the cloud without buying it. And also data, now this is uh, things like material properties and industrial data from existing furnaces or kilns or other reactors. And the data is the, the link between the computational models and the real world. And this is also the reason why computational modeling cannot survive in isolation. It all, it's always dependent on, on, on experimental or measurement work or industrial work in some way or form to make it valid um, and, and credible. Now, if we just zoom in a little bit uh, into the team, uh, the, the types of knowledge and experience and skills that are required, and, and I'm highlighting experience there because uh, these things are, it's difficult to, to give these types of assignments to, to something that's just finished his degree or even has just finished his, his PhD. Um, so, for example, pyrometallurgy, uh, we need to, in our team, we need uh, knowledge, skills and experience related to processes, reactors, materials, and specifically not just from an academic perspective or a research perspective. We sh in our team, we need people who have lived this or we need to collaborate with our clients with um, uh, process engineers and production engineers that have lived, that have seen this. It's indispensable to, to doing good quality computational modeling. Um, we need to understand chemical and physical phenomena like thermochemistry, kinetics, heat transfer, mass transfer, fluid mechanics, electromagnetics. Now you can pick any one of those things. It's a specialist area on its own. And then when we look at modeling, then you have things like mathematics, numerics, software and computer skills. And it's the combination of all of those things that, that we need to master to ultimately do modeling work that is meaningful. It's easy to install a piece of software, click a few buttons and, and draw some pictures. 
but to do modeling work that really uh, is credible and meaningful and contributes to, to technology development or design, uh, it's, it's not that, uh, that simple. So uh, this makes it difficult and slow to, to get uh, modeling work, to get the critical mass of modeling work uh, and a team started. This is definitely not a, in my view, a one person job. You need a team of people to do this properly. Now, if we look at the enablers, I've mentioned some of them. Um, good quality hardware is readily available. And uh, you, if you have an internet connection and a credit card, you can uh, fire up uh, almost as many CPUs uh, as, you, as you want to, to run your models on, as long as your credit card doesn't max out. Um, and open source software gives us in its mentor great flexibility. Um, if uh, it doesn't really matter uh, what physics or chemistry I dream up when I, when I go to Alfred, uh, he can translate that into math and numerics and implement it on the computer. And uh, we can scale it um, to hundreds or uh, in theory to thousands of CPUs on, on, on clusters. Um, without paying uh, uh, cost, uh, additional cost for that, which is uh, often a challenge when we use commercial software. And also, um, because we need a diverse team, and often uh, the client is part of the team, uh, collaboration tools like Zoom that we're using at the moment are also a great enabler because the, the project theme can now be distributed even across uh, different continents. Uh, the, the Kiln project that I mentioned before, we uh, concluded that entire project over, I think it was about 18 months, without traveling to Canada once, uh, we were able to complete it. Uh, so from these perspectives, we've got a lot going for us. Now, the challenges that, that are associated with computational modeling, I've mentioned this material property data, if you don't have good data, um, yeah, the, the quality of the results that you have are questionable. We then typically do use uh, uh, sensitivity analyses to, to, to estimate and, and inf uh, determine the influence of, of these properties. But the better the property data you have, the, the more easily you can progress with the modeling work. Um, again, compute. Um, Thermodynamics is very important in high temperature processes because of the high temperatures and uh, the equilibrium calculations that we do in fact such are really invaluable um, to give us the ability to estimate uh, what will happen at the process conditions in, in these furnaces. The problem is that uh, I can include all the physics such as heat transfer, mass transfer, fluid flow, electromagnetics, all of those things we can incorporate into multi-physics modeling at this stage, but we cannot incorporate the most crucial part, which is the thermochemistry, the second law of thermodynamics. Because if we put that into the multi-physics model, um, you know, your grandchildren will not even get the results uh, because it, it will just be so slow and it does not scale at all. It makes it extremely expensive. And it, generally it makes it infeasible to solve these models. So that is a challenge that, that we are currently working on. Then I think uh, another challenge that is, is preventing uh, computational modeling from being uh, used more in industry, I think there are certain perceptions and, and in sometimes rightfully so, also distrust and, and, and also misunderstanding of, of what modeling is and how it should be used. Um, and uh, if, if you have a perception of, uh, okay, that number is wrong, so the model is wrong, so the model is useful, then that will uh, create a, a, a roadblock for the application of modeling. And I think uh, there has also been lots of instances in, in industry where models have, modeling work has been done badly and people have been burned and, and they've lost trust in this. Um, I think the, the greatest bottleneck is probably people. 
uh, we really need good people to do good modeling work. And uh, the, 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 the breed of people are, you don't find them uh, uh, all that often. And I, I also think uh, if, if, we, if we have a greater push from industry for this type of work, we can, we can uh, attract people from a, from a young age at uh, under, undergrad level, get them through postgrad studies and, and, and uh, prepare them to, to do this, this type of work properly. So these are the real challenges uh, that we need to talk about. How do we, uh, how do we uh, address them? Um, if we look now at uh, modeling, how does it fit into, into technology development? Um, now, first of all, um, the development life cycle in, in modeling and, and technology development spans stages such as concept, uh, the, the conceptual stage, laboratory test work, desktop level, evaluation, pilot scale test work, demonstration scale, and then ultimately industrial scale. And during that life cycle of technology development, uh, we, there's a number of activities that, that we um, are involved with, uh, like uh, doing research, uh, determining whether the idea or the concept is physically feasible, determining whether it is practically or technically feasible can the is the equipment available um, it, are there materials of construction that can can do what we need to do uh, then financial feasibility and economic feasibility become important at, at uh, pilot and demonstration scale and then also once a project gets a go-ahead you go through design construction commissioning operation and improvement um, now, where can, can modeling contribute to all of these things? And it's, it's really throughout the entire life cycle that we can use the different models that, that I've identified earlier. Uh, material property models are, are always applicable. Thermochemistry, because it's pyrometallurgy, it's always applicable. Uh, process models are also generally uh, very useful. They can sometimes be very simple tools, but they are generally very useful uh, until uh, into operation. Um, flow sheet models, yeah, like I said, it, especially during design, uh, it can be very valuable to make, uh, make the flow sheet do uh, the appropriate amount of work and, and, and not dumping a lot of complexity of, or problems on a, on a critical process unit. Uh, multi-physics work also from desktop level through uh, we can use multi-physics models to drive the, the technology development process uh, and techno-economic models as well doing the, the, the feasibility calculations financial and economic feasibility type calculations become important from desktop um, throughout now if we look at the needs uh, of industry if we if a company wants to build a new plant and they want some technological solution to do that, they generally have, uh, we, we need it to be good, fast and cheap. That's ideal with no risk. These are the main drivers, quality, pace and cost. Uh, and uh, something that spans the entire project is risk. Now, ideally, uh, if we could have something like that, yeah, this, whoever uh, is able to, to achieve this would be making lots of money. But unfortunately, in reality, between good, fast and cheap, you have, to, you have to pick two of the three. If it's good and fast, it won't be cheap. If it's uh, fast and cheap, it won't be good. And if it's good and cheap, it won't be fast. Um, and uh, depending on which combination of those two things you pick, uh, you, uh, you will have a certain level of risk. Now, if we look at, at quality and pace or development life cycle duration and cost, what can modeling contribute to, to, to this uh, situation? Now, when we model, 
we invest in understanding and insight. So we ultimately will be able to provide better quality designs and better quality um, technologies. Also, if we sensibly combine uh, laboratory scale test work, pilot scale work, if there's industrial uh, uh, reactors available, industrial data with computational modeling, we can learn more, we can make more, more of the, the combination of models and, 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 and data so that we can accelerate the development cycles. Um, and this is one of the, the ways that we, we can fail. We can come up with designs that we soon realize due to uh, simulation results that a design is, is flawed or it will fail in operation and then we can correct it. And by doing this, if we do this sensibly, uh, we can reduce cost throughout the entire life cycle. During technology development, you will reduce cost, but also you can accelerate the startup uh, curve of a, of, of a plant, for example, and, and get into operation to full production in, in 12 months instead of 36 months. And if we look at those types of things, we're talking substantial amounts of money. And ultimately, we can, we can reduce risk as well. So we can get closer to the ideal good, fast and cheap with no risk, but, but, it, but it will still not be, um, it will still not be um, at the ideal, but we can get closer. So, so modeling can definitely add value. Um, so in conclusion, so what is the punchline? Um, just casting our eyes back to South Africa, uh, given our current situation, to, to move forward and, and, and get back to our feet, we will have to do more with less. We have less infrastructure, less uh, energy, we have less of, of, of lots of stuff. Uh, uh, but that doesn't mean it, it's the end of the world. Um, I think in, in growing our industry, developing our industry, modeling can definitely contribute substantially to moving forward. And uh, to do this, uh, we need to address the challenges of data, property data, equilibrium calculations and perceptions, and, and, and most importantly of people. And uh, I'm convinced that we, we have to do this working together. Uh, no one person or one company uh, is, is available. This, we have to do this as a community together. Uh, but I think there's substantial uh, uh, opportunities in doing this. And that is my, that's my story for the day. Thanks very much, Johan. Uh, much appreciated. A very interesting presentation, comprehensive examination of the whole uh, field of computational modeling and how it uh, how it affects everything in our industry potentially so i think we'll open up the the floor now for questions uh if anybody has a question just raise your hand and we'll select you and unmute you otherwise feel free to use the q a section to type a question harman harman otterdom Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, well, thank you very much, Johan, for your presentation. Uh, we've, we've talked about numerous of these things. Um, in all your slides about what we need, there was one thing that I did not see back, and it's when, when I started as an engineer, I was hoping not to be too involved with people, but the thing is what we're, what we're missing here is things like creativity, debate, discussions, and inclusivity. inclusivity. It's, it's the, the guts to ask questions and then to deal with people asking critical questions about what has been done instead of the sales department slashing that person down or a professor saying no that's not it because my thesis 20 years ago was different i know we need more we need to be more internal critical and, and have these social skills of dealing with criticism and creativity i guess what do you think yeah i think uh, i've been technically minded and very task oriented for for most of my life because I like the technical stuff, but uh, I think we all discover as we become older uh, that the technical stuff 
that, that are important, but it's the people issues that really make make a business a success or a project a success. So yeah, I agree, Armin. Uh, there must be room for that. I think one of the things that that modeling also does for me, it, it's 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 very humbling. Uh, it it shows you up very quickly where you are flawed and where you 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 misinterpret things. So um, it, it brings you back, uh, down down to earth quite quickly so that you are able to be open generally for, for other people's inputs. Um, at least that's been my experience. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Johan, we've got a question on, um, on the chat. Do you think quantum computing could help you reach the holy grail of integrated thermodynamics and physical models? Yeah, it's quantum computing. Then we would have the answer yesterday, right? Um, I think, well, I, I don't know enough about quantum computing, but certainly if, if the, the computational capacity is going to accelerate in the way uh, that people are saying, yes, that it can definitely contribute. Uh, we are running a project in Exmente to address that problem of integrating thermochemistry. Um, our colleague uh, Willem Ruiz, uh, he's doing uh, a PhD on, on accelerating uh, thermochemical equilibrium calculations to make it feasible to integrate it into the multiphysics models. And he's been uh, progressing fairly nicely and we, we should see if everything goes well the first version of that accelerator uh, in operation by the end of this year. And we, we're quite excited about that, obviously. Yeah, that'll be exciting. Okay, um, we've got another one on the chat. Um, the modeling of pyrometallurgical processes may require computationally expensive algorithms to realize. Um, and basically in terms of what current computers are, can handle, could you maybe outline some of the algorithms that are mostly, most commonly used? Um, I think for the type of things that we do, we use finite, the, the finite volume method for uh, transport phenomena, heat transfer, fluid flow, all of those things. And, and uh, broadly inside that framework of, of the finite volume method, we, we can fit most things into that. Uh, if we look at structural things like the deformation of a, of a refractory lining as we're heating a furnace up, then we use uh, the finite uh, element uh, approach. Uh, it's, it's more uh, suited for that. Um, so those algorithms, if we can call it that, by themselves are not computationally expensive. I think what makes them uh, expensive or what makes the models expensive are the scale. So if it's a large furnace and you have to refine your mesh and also if you have a large number of partial differential equations that you need to solve, that is what brings us the, the computational expense. But what is nice with something like OpenFoam, the, the, the framework that we use for the modeling work, is you can parallelize and, and you can rip this domain apart, breaking it, break it into separate parts and distribute it over a cluster of computers to, to make that work uh, a lot faster uh, running it in parallel. Uh, the, the most expensive algorithm in the context of, of multiphysics modeling at the moment is this equilibrium calculation. Uh, and that's the reason why we can't, we can't really use it at the moment. Yeah, no, that's, that's a good point, John. I think one of the, uh, maybe just a, a follow-up question from my side. Um, you, I think you touched a lot on the value of open source in terms of its, uh, you know, its ability to accelerate computational modeling. It's, it's probably also worth mentioning that um, open source has other advantages like um, transparency, for example, um, where often these, these computational models are phenomenally complex in terms of their, their software development and the mathematics that they embody. And not being able to look into them does actually raise quite a lot of concerns about whether they're doing things properly. 
Yeah, and I think this is a, um, an approach choice that we, that you make, I think, fairly early on. Are you happy to work with a black box commercial package and not be responsible for, for example, the numerics? Or are you, do you need to have the flexibility to write your own equations and be, take responsibility for the numerics? Uh, now, I'm more inclined towards the latter. Uh, I prefer having a competent person that can take responsibility for, uh, uh, for the numerical part of it because the numerics can, can completely invalidate the results that the, that the model uh, provides. And with a commercial package, you might not realize that. I'm not sure. I, I cannot criticize the commercial packages because I have little to no experience with them. Um, uh, but I think it's horses for courses and it's pretty much a, a choice that you make. Uh, in both cases, you have to take the responsibility very seriously to make sure that you produce uh, credible results. Correct. Yeah. No, thanks. Okay. So we've got another one from the, uh, from the chat. Uh, what can you tell us about the future of machine learning and new AI algorithms applied to Pyro? Uh, in, yeah, in terms of uh, computational modeling of, uh, let's say, in the multi-physics frame, um, I don't think uh, it's meaningful to, to, to try and replace that with, with machine learning. Where I do think machine learning can come into play is if we've got uh, sufficient data to, to back calculate things like material properties for us. Um, so I think there, there's definitely, there will be room for it, but especially in biometallurgy, the, the physics, the, in, the influence of the physics is, is so strong uh, uh, it, and, it, and to be able to deal with that explicitly is probably um, the right way of going about it because if you have a black box model that that tries to simulate the high temperature process uh, yeah i wouldn't know how to trust that and, and how to interpret it or, or how to know when things go wrong fair enough yeah okay another one off the chat uh, what are the main difficulties in integrating thermodynamics into our current fluid flow or thermal models I think you've touched on that a fair bit already, but maybe if there's anything more you want to unpack on it, go ahead. Um, uh, I think the, 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 is, the essence of that is that um, when we do, uh, when we do mo uh, uh, multi-physics modeling, generally we tend to make assumptions about material properties, for example, viscosity we choose a viscosity and that viscosity or thermal conductivity remains constant throughout the execution of the model. While in reality, things like, for example, the behavior of the freeze lining is, is influenced by varying viscosity uh, on that interface between the bath and the freeze lining. Now, um, the, that interface between the bath and the freeze lining is influenced by the thermochemical behavior of the slag cooling down and uh, so it's heat transfer and the thermochemistry that interplays there. Um, and by being able to incorporate the, the thermochemistry into these models, we'll be able to much more um, realistically represent those situations. And one of the things that we are currently looking into uh, regarding ilmenite smelting is how does this interplay between the bath and, and the freeze lining um, and the thermochemistry? How does that influence the, the, uh, the dynamics of the process? Because ilmenite smelting is well known as being one of the most difficult processes to operate. It's a very temperamental, bad tempered process. And if you ask anybody uh, in industry, they will agree that it, that is a fact, it is the case. The ilmenite smelting is that just that difficult. Now the question in my mind is why is it that difficult? It must be rooted 
in material properties, physical behavior, and if we understand those well enough, then I believe we can, we can design ilmenite smelters that are less temperamental. So that, that is the reason why I want to, to, to we, and at Xmenta our team wants to, to integrate the thermochemistry into these models. Right, yeah, okay. Um, another one off the chat, Johan, what do you think is necessary to create a broader industrial interest in process modeling? Uh, a few options are listed as speed, white box modeling, accessibility of models, user interface to models or other. I think uh, a talk like today is, is, I think, a step in that direction. Uh, I see it's from Alice Marcos, I Alice. Um, I think communication has a lot to do with it because in industry, uh, we sit with people that, that have the mandate and, and the authority to make these types of decisions. But if, if they don't understand and, and have trust in the people doing this and have trust in uh, that uh, these models are credible and what the limitations or the, or the roles are that the, the models can play, then those people will find it very difficult to make uh, good um, business decisions regarding that. So the modeling then itself, uh, I think needs to be done in a credible manner and we have to be very open and transparent about the limitations of what, of what we do. Uh, because it's not the holy cattle, it's one of the links, it's one of the pieces uh, with experiments and, and, and pilot plant work that we can use to, do, to, to move forward. And I think if, uh, if we are able to win uh, industry's trust in that way, that will uh, open the door for, for very mutualistic uh, working together. Thanks, yeah. Okay, so another one of the chat. You mentioned there is a high failure rate of models incorporating new technologies. Uh, in your opinion, why does this happen? Uh, the assumption is that we've reached a high degree of R&D compared to the 1980s, for example, or have we not really advanced at all? Or is it something inherent in the, the problems of new technologies? Okay, I see this is from Revash Singh. Uh, Revash, um, okay, it's not a high failure rate of models, but rather a high failure rate of projects, right? Um, so the, 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 the statistics that I, that I showed show that if you do large industrial projects that involve substantial use of new technology, then, then they have failed, that have a high probability of failure. Now, I think uh, having been involved in some of these large in industrial projects and seeing how engineering companies and owners teams deal with them in some cases, I think it's just not taking care, proper care of the details and um, doing what is necessary. If, if, you, if you don't um, expend the effort during the, 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 the technology development phase or the project development phase, uh, there's a high um, risk of, uh, of failure for a project. Uh, also, I think structure and discipline uh, comes into it in these projects and that leads to a topic which I, I did, is also related to new technology development that I didn't want to address today and that's systems engineering. I think uh, building new plants and, uh, and uh, you know, developing new technologies can, can be made a lot smoother, faster and cheaper if we uh, uh, use uh, systems engineering uh, properly. Uh, so those failures, I think, uh, are generally resulting in uh, or, or the result of, of poor preparation, in, in, in my view. Yeah, no, definitely. I think, you know, one of the valuable uh, applications of computational modeling, as you pointed out, is in that de-risking stage, the ability to uh, fail fast, fail cheaply. And uh, that's something we need to be exploiting more and more in our industry where, where 
things fail, they fail bad and hard. So yeah, it's a good point. Okay, so we've got a question from Petrus, Johan. Speaking of parallel processing, to what extent can off-the-shelf software fits facilitate parallel processing, or do you need custom code software for parallel processing? Um, I think I, I think you and I can um, both talk quite Petrus, a lot. <laughs> For parallel processing, the, the things that, that we tend to use, uh, FactSage, for example, does not know anything about parallel processing, so that's a completely zero package. Uh, but the, the other things that we use, like KMAPI, we've, we've built uh, the FactSage calculations into Python that you can parallelize very nicely. OpenFoam. Uh, parallelizes very beautifully. You don't need to do custom code. You you configure the models to, to parallelize and run over multiple cores. So the infrastructure for for uh, for parallel processing, is especially in, in in open source software, is fantastic. So we can really uh, get full value from the hardware that we've got. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a good point again, that the, the open source world is probably a lot more advanced in many ways in terms of adopting the, the sort of parallel paradigms. So they, they've, they, they definitely do better at it. Okay, so we've got a question from Marcus. Uh, is there scope for computational modeling to become a core stream at undergraduate engineering level at universities? Say, have it introduced as a focus stream from third year, third year or fourth year level with the caveat of perhaps studying five years, but then exiting with a master's or something like that? Um, Marcus, I think we will have to look carefully um, at how we, we teach our undergrads, especially in the process engineering uh, fields. I think the mechanical engineers are preparing their graduates very well for this type of thing. But traditionally, especially metallurgical engineering has not been doing this. And um, I think uh, a specialist stream or uh, on postgraduate level, even, I think uh, it, it could be employed very successfully and it's necessary. Uh, so if anybody is here from, from the university side, uh, then uh, computational modeling in, 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 in the met metallurgy field in South Africa is definitely something that we have to look at. Uh, not only pyrometallurgy, but process engineering in, in general, mineral processing, hydromet, etc. Yeah, no, it's definitely, that's a conversation we need to be having more of, is how we get good people educated into this field. Uh, Johan, I think that's it for the questions. I don't see any more and I don't see any more hands up. So I think you've uh, answered everything to everyone's satisfaction. Thank you very much for an extremely interesting presentation. There were quite a lot of comments and uh, thank yous that came through. So um, yeah, thank you very, very much for your time once again. And uh, yeah, thanks, for, thanks a lot to everybody else for attending. Thank you. And from my side, uh, thank you to the SIIMM for, for taking the initiative to, to arrange this, in, especially in this lockdown period. It's, it's giving us, given us new opportunities. And Quinn, for you for chairing, uh, and my colleagues for supporting me and prepare, preparing the, uh, the presentation. And for everybody who attended, uh, I know everybody's time is valuable, so I really appreciate it. Yeah, great. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a good afternoon.